We are back, you are chatting with John P. Today, we are going to be talking about watches that you should not sell. Now, I'm going to be sharing with you some stories from my watch collecting history and past of watches that I now regret that I sold. Now, these are gonna be broken up into different categories of watches, or more so, I'm going to be sharing with you the reasons why I think you should not sell certain watches as collectors. Now, I will say, of course, part of watch collecting is we all have our preferences and tastes, and we're free to do what, certainly what we'd like to do as people and watch collectors. That is uh, certainly withstanding, but what, the reason I want to share this with you is because I get so many questions, comments, emails, both on my Instagram, the real John P, as well as DelrayWatch.com, by the way, where we buy, sell, and trade watches. But we get so many inquiries from people that are looking to add watches back to their collection that they sold in the past, usually for reasons um, relating to the watch was worth more. So they sold, realized some gains, and then now the watches are worth even a little bit more and they want to put that watch back in their collection. So I personally see this all this all the time and myself i've also kind of suffered from this uh this trend really so i'm going to share with you some interesting stories and some watches that i think even besides the classifications of the types of watches that they are you'll see what i mean in a second also all the watches are probably on an upward trend anyways for collective collectability and desirability, so more so than just the financial aspect, I'll touch on some other reasons why if you have a watch that resonates similarly, you should probably consider keeping this in your collection. So the first watch that I wanna share with you is a very special Omega Speedmaster. Now the first thing that's gonna to come to mind is, yes, John, we get it. Omega comes out with special watches all the time, and the Speedmaster is not an exception, right? There's so many different types of Speedmasters out there, the Tokyo Games, the, um, the Moon to Mars, the Gemini, the Apollo, all of the missions, right? The Speedmaster has so many different variations, but one of the earliest examples of the Omega Speedmaster Professional that was limited is the Mission Series. Now, Omega debuted a couple of decades ago a Mission Series, and there were a couple of ways you could buy it, either individually, some of the watches um, obviously commemorating certain NASA space missions. Um, you could buy them individually, either um, you know, certain missions came where you could buy just that one particular example, or there was also a box set which included many Speedmaster mission series and some of the Speedmaster mission series watches only came in that box set. And occasionally you see one of these briefcases, you know, it's in this kind of you know, uh, spaceship looking kind of briefcase aluminum or metal box, kind of like a Halliburton case, they come up every so often and they sell for a few hundred thousand dollars, I think, and one hasn't come up in a while, so really who knows what the, the, the market price is for something like that, but we do know what the market prices are individually. Um, and by the way, I think that the boxes for this watch is the one of the coolest, if not the coolest, watch box that has ever been created. It's a material that's similar to a spacesuit, and when I had the Gemini, by the way, I had one of the Gemini Omega Speedmaster Missions uh, series watches, I just loved the box. It was like a spacesuit, and it was something so cool, and this was kind of my foray or my entry into higher-end watches when I, was, when I was much younger. I think when I bought my Mission Series Gemini, I actually purchased it from an authorized dealer that had it new old stock because, you know, what is this, almost 12 years ago, Speedmasters were, okay, you know, a nice watch, but you could still walk into a Rolex AD and buy that Daytona or Submariner, and a lot of people did that. As time went on, they become more desirable, um, and now what you see is you see a lot of trickle over or people that you know maybe cannot obtain the, the Daytona, which is most people, um, or the, the, something like that from the Rolex or Patek Philippe collections, they come over to the, the Speedmasters, which are you know in stock for the most part, not considering Snoopy's and, and other you know um, more limited production uh, series watches. But nonetheless, I regret selling this watch because it was just so special and it was one of my first higher end watches and the replacement value today is much higher than it was. Now the reason that I sold it was because I think I paid 
uh, about three thousand U.S. dollars at the time. I remember haggling with the authorized dealer back when uh, Omega authorized dealers were still, you know, doing their best to make a sale. It wasn't like it is today, where the discounts are kind of drying up uh, on hot Omega watches. Definitely, um, but. Within a couple of weeks, I immediately sold the watch for, I believe, about $5,000 US dollars cash. And so at the time, it was like, wow, this is so cool. And that's kind of when I started flipping and trading watches um, just so early. Uh, but at the same time, you'll see the rest of my list that kind of left me in this pattern for quite a long time of, you know, when I got bored of the watch or if there was a big gain to be had, I would get rid of it. But if I love the watch, later the replacement value is so high. For example, this exact watch now you'd be hard pressed to find one in $10,000 in the United States. And then if you want great condition or new old stock, forget about it. I think um, you know some of the other mission series sell for much more, but the Gemini is cool and I just like it for those reasons. So the first category of watches do not sell is something that you know marks a special time in your life. And this time was me kind of really getting into you know, higher end watches. But if I had not sold it for the profit, I may never have realized you could kind of make money from watches or turn it into a career. And I may have never started Delray Watch. So who knows, perhaps it's for the best. Next, now this is another one that I truly am surprised to see where the prices have gone. Now I know I'm running on a bit of an increase in price theme here, but that's just because, hey, Watches now are selling at premiums. If you are an avid watch collector, or maybe if you're just starting out, maybe you're starting to see this, but if you're a watch collector, you know that watches are just fetching premiums right now. If it's a good watch, it's selling for much more than it was a year ago, and that's just the facts. Now, this particular watch that I regret selling is a Jager LeCoultre 37 millimeters triple calendar watch. Now, it's a JLC or a Jaeger LeCoultre if that's the pronunciation that you typically use. But nonetheless, I sold this watch because the day wheel, was it the day wheel? Or perhaps it was the month wheel. One of the wheels was in a different language, right? So one of the wheels on the watch, you know, it's a triple calendar, right? So one of the wheels was in a different language. And at first it didn't really bother me, but as time went on, I kind of started scratching my head and I thought, well, I'll just get the English market or you know the, the, the watch that was made for the United States market, I'll get that one instead. Um, but that time never came up. The watch never came up. And it's kind of unfortunate because this particular watch, I still enjoy it to this day. I would, if, I would still add one of these to my collection to this day. But JLC has seen such an increase in secondhand or used market prices the last few years. It just doesn't make sense at that point, I think, considering all the other interesting things I've been adding uh, to my collection. By the way, on the wrist today, um, let's take a little break from that thought to show you I have a La Cultura, so a La Cultura vintage Valjoux 72 chronograph watch. I absolutely love this watch. I've been wearing it a lot recently. Um, it's still kind of summer here in South Florida, so uh, the bracelet watch is where it's at. But I love this, and I think this is also going to increase um, in desirability. Set that aside, back to the point I was talking about. The reason and the category of watch that you shouldn't sell, in my opinion, if you, if you wanted to ask me, um, as someone that's been there, done that, and sees this every day from fellow collectors, is a watch that fits so perfectly on your wrist. And I hear this all the time. And now, by the way, this watch fit perfectly on my wrist on a strap. I didn't have it on the bracelet. I had it on a strap and it just fits so well. That 37 millimeter case size is something JLC doesn't do anymore. Few brands do anymore. JLC has gone to a more thick case. They've got, you know, kind of these aesthetic hues um, or cues rather, um, from vintage watches, but it's just not there. There's still thicker cases. They're making the watches in, in like a 40 millimeter with a bit of a thicker case size because that's what a lot of people want, so they're providing it. But this particular watch just fits so well. The 37 millimeter JLC um, period in, of time, I think, is just so classic. Um, even though they weren't as you know popular as they are today, I just miss it for that fit reason. So if you have a watch that you really like, but there's just something maybe about it that you say, ah, I don't really care for it for that reason. If it fits perfect, you love wearing it just because of that feeling, I would recommend not getting rid of it. And I can share with you, for example, the Rolex Oyster Perpetual 39. 
I receive so many questions, comments, because I own one myself. I own the Red Grape. Federico owns the Rhodium Dial OP39. He has a really big wrist. I have a very small wrist. It fits perfectly on both of us. And so many people reach out to me and say, you know, I really wish I didn't sell my OP, my Rolex OP39. Do you have one coming in? And sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But when we do, it fetches a premium because other people really like the way it fits as well. Now, it's a Rolex. So granted, you know, it's fetching a premium for that reason as well. But nonetheless, you get the idea, this is something that happens. If the watch fits perfectly, you get rid of the watch, you have to hunt it down again, you just can't find it. That just kind of becomes a bummer. I see it, I experience it myself. To share with you another watch, there was someone recently who reached out to us that had an Elaine Silverstein that they sold to us a few years ago, and they reached out to us recently, and they said, hey, you know, this watch just fits so perfectly on my wrist. They really loved how thick it was. You know, if you know El Ellen Silverstein or Elaine Silverstein's watches, their chronographs are really chunky, you know, especially when you get into the Gummy series. Uh, they're really thick watches and they loved it. And now, you know, of course we've long since sold the watch, but there's others out there. It's just the premiums are higher. So once again, yeah, touching on the financial aspect, but the fit alone of the watch is also what is causing them some regret. So this happens all the time. So I would recommend once again, I'm rambling at this point, but if you have a watch that you love the way it feels, don't sell it unless you have to. Next, a watch I regret selling, and this, I think a lot of people are going to be in this boat. Now, this is a Gerald Genta Arena. Now, the particular model that I had was the smaller case size, I believe it was 38 millimeters, and I had this watch, I think I bought this watch maybe 10 years ago, and I kept it for a while, and then I sold it because it just wasn't getting the wrist time, right? I felt myself gravitating to more popular brands because this is, at the time, other watch geeks, which, or, you know, watch collectors like myself, they, wa they wanted to talk about, you know, Rolex. They want to talk about, you know, JLC, for that example, or other things that were up and coming, Moser. But at that point in time, Gerald Genta was just known as kind of like this guy that designed some interesting watches. And the watch collecting community hadn't really kind of structured their mentality or they haven't really focused around watches that he produced just yet, right? People knew what he did, but it wasn't really like what it is today where even you see Bulgari coming out with Gerald Genta watches, you know, the Disney Gerald Genta watches. And so Gerald Genta was just kind of something interesting, cool, unique, but it wasn't getting any wrist time. I in the back of my head, I knew that someday because of what Gerald Genta was and what he meant into watches, if more watch collectors existed, it would just rise that brand and the Gerald Genta watches would be more collectible. I paid at that time, you know, whenever I bought this, maybe upwards of a decade ago, I, I literally paid nothing for the watch. I mean, something, right? But I think it was like something like 700 US dollars and that was pre-owned from a dealer and so, that just goes to show you, Gerald Genta was, it was a tough sell back then. Now, when we get Gerald Gentas in at Delray Watch, they go sometimes the same day, depending on the dial configuration. So I regret moving that one just because at that point in time, in my collecting, I, I was, you know, as I was discovering more brands and developing and looking at the watch community, I kind of followed the herd a little bit. But at the same time, you know, if you do follow the herd, then you don't really get the best benefits of being a first adopter or first discoverer to some of these brands like the Gerald Genta. So if you have a watch like this, or for example, I think Moser's a great one to look at. Moser someday is very likely, they're positioned with everything that they do, their vertical integration, they're positioned to be, you know, perhaps the next Jorn or something like that, right? You get the idea with the desirability. Um, but, you know, we have a Moser at Delray Watch, you know, that, that person, they just, yeah, they, it wasn't for them at that time. But I would not be surprised if in a few years when Moser takes that position, they're going to say, hey, you know, I really want to put a Moser in my collection now. And this is something I see quite frequently. So if, if you have something that's special and unique and you don't need to sell it, I would recommend holding on to it because watch collecting is getting more popular and if it's unique and special other people will eventually see it catch on and that's going to increase the value desirability and also you'll have kind of that interesting conversation piece of hey i was into gerald Gentit before everyone else you know kind of like a a hipster kind of thing um, but you get the idea the next watch 
Now, this one's going to be kind of a no-brainer and a little bit cliche, I understand that, but probably every Rolex that I've owned in the past and ended up selling, I regret selling, but only a little bit. Now, let me explain. Of course, we know Rolex prices are, are, are really through the roof right now. Rolex watches are super high demand, fetching large premiums. Now, with my watches, I've if someone has ever really approached, right, because I'm on Instagram, I'm on, you know, obviously Delroy Watch now and so many other places. If someone has approached me and they saw that a watch that was in my personal collection and they just had to have it, I would sell it to them. I really would, right? If they were willing to pay the market or sometimes even more than market if it was a special watch, I would sell them the watch, no problem, uh, especially if they wanted it much more than me because I knew I could find it again, or at least I thought. And so, you know, with the Rolex models, that is true, but I will say that I've owned a lot of different Rolex models in the past and I've ended up selling them and then years later you know sometimes they're worth double if not more um, just depending on what it is I mean I remember I purchased a Rolex 16014 quite a long time ago you know maybe 10 years ago at this point I think I paid something like I don't know $2,500 full kit box and papers you know like a new old stock kind of scenario and now those are trading at some instances, depending on the dial, more than double that. You know, it depends on the serial serial year. You get that, but uh, nonetheless, you know, they've really gone a lot way. So I would say, just throwing this out there as uh, you know, an obvious point, but a point nonetheless is any Rolex I've I've ever sold, I kind of regret it now because the prices are so high. Um, so something to consider, right? If you're on the fence, you have a Rolex watch, maybe you're thinking of selling it because you think, hey, I'll get out now before the market collapses. Just at a larger scale, the Rolex watches have kind of gone up, right? So why time the market? But that's just my opinion. What do you think? Do you think Rolex price increase um, on the secondhand market is here to stay? Do you, do you see the demand being here to stay? Or do you think this is kind of a, a phase and you know the numbers will come back down for the brand? I'd love to hear your opinions in the comments below. And lastly, we have a watch that I truly do regret selling. Now the prices have gone up again, of course, you know, not a shock there. Most watch prices that are decent or better watches, the prices have gone up secondhand over the last few years. That is without a doubt, but a lot of prices of things have gone up as well. So this one's not totally about price. This is entirely about what I think the scarcity in the market is and how much I enjoyed the watch, right? So if it's an uncommon watch, once again, and you love it so much for more than a few reasons, or even one reason alone, I wouldn't sell the watch. And this is a Gerard Perigo Laureato 38. Now, this watch, many thought of, oh, it's just a, uh, it's just a, a Royal Oak alternative, right? I've even made videos myself of best Royal Oak alternatives with this watch, I think, being the number one. And this watch has become really an icon in its own. Now, Gerard Perigo is a legendary manufacturer, one of the oldest manufacturers of Swiss watches that exist, and they make very fine, high-quality watches, many of which, if not most, include in-house movements and very advanced testing and mechanics behind these movements. But they weren't always as popular as they are today, and I'm not even saying that today they are that popular, but for the amount of watches that circulate out there currently for Gerard Perigo, what we're seeing now is an increase in demand for all watches, high quality watches. People can't get the AP Royal Oaks. They're not willing to pay a premium because they're selling for sometimes double, if not more, the retail price. So they're gravitated towards watches that are now selling used for almost retail price, which brings us to the Gerard Perigo Laureato 38. Now, I remember when I bought this Laureato 38, I want to think that I paid like $4,500 um, out of Japan. I believe I bought this from a Japan private seller on Chrono24 a handful of years ago, and I loved it. The 38 size just wore so well on my, uh, on my smaller wrist, and just everything about it was high quality and class, and in my opinion, perfection for that kind of sports watch design and shape that we all know and love, or at least most of us, or some of us, I don't know. You get the picture. But I sold it because once again, if someone approaches me, they see it on Instagram, they say, hey, I have to have that, and they're offering me something much more than I paid for, 
I would sell it to them. And a lot of collectors are like this, right? You go to the meetups and people say, hey, I'd love that. I'll trade you this watch for that watch or I'll pay you this or a partial trade. So it's super common. It happens all the time. And, you know, most people can only put so many watches in their watch box. So that was the scenario that I was in at the time. But now I just can't find a Gerard Perigo Laureato 38 anywhere out there. Now we have connections that authorize dealers. Um, but they also have had difficult time being able to order the 38 size. Now I'm not saying, oh, by the way, I'm not talking about the chronograph. I'm talking about just the standard Gerard Perigo Laureato 38. And so I'm sure that there's some of these still floating around, but there were so, probably so few people that actually purchased this watch because it was smaller. Most people went to the 42. In my opinion, it was much more desirable case size. It was larger. And that's just the trends of watches, right? That 41, 42 is really, really hot right now, 38, not so much the hottest size for this type of uh, integrated bracelet sports watch. Um, but anyway, I just really don't see too many of these floating around. So now when I actually wanna put one of these back in my collection, it's not available and I literally just can't do it. Now I'm sure, you know, if I actually spent a little bit of time and hunted around seriously, I'll be able to find one, but I'm sure I'm gonna be, be finding it at retail price. And even though I think it's a wonderful watch, I really don't think that it's a watch that I would add to my collection at retail price when as a watch dealer, you know, I'm, I'm purchasing watches for the most part at wholesale or really great deals because, you know, it's part of the industry, right? We're buying, we're selling, I'm getting really great prices. So for me to buy a watch, even though I believe in it at retail price, it just kind of, it hits me the wrong way considering, you know, I remember, what is it, two years ago buying this watch, maybe a little bit more than that, at like $4,000 now to pay the retail, which is, I think they actually raised the price, G GP increased the prices on their watches. I think this is probably like a $12,000 watch now, have to pay retail on it because there's just not a lot of them out there. Just not something I would do. I would rather buy really cool vintage watches or something that I think uh, has the potential to, to perform a little bit better uh, as opposed to probably immediately go down um, because the watch doesn't have the demand. So you get the idea. Uh, mostly because of the case size, not the actual watch. So this watch, I regret selling at the GP Laureato 38. Now, what watches do you out there regret selling? Are there any watches that you regret selling? I know there's a lot of guys out there that like to flip watches, change watches in and out, maybe make a few dollars along the way. What watches do you regret selling? Or maybe you are one of the people that have never sold a watch, only added to your collection, and now you have dozens and dozens of watches and you just don't know what to put on your wrist. I would love to hear that in the comments below. And yes, I know uh, this was a little bit longer that of a video than it needed to be, but obviously I'm sharing with you personal stories, personal experiences, and that's what watch collecting is all about, right? We get the watches, we get really enthused by them, we're enthusiasts after all, and we get passionate about them, and that's why we're on YouTube on a Friday talking about watches, what we love and enjoy. Comments below, don't forget to like and subscribe. I really do appreciate it. You can check me out. Instagram, the real John P and delraywatch.com where myself and the team are just busting it, bringing in amazing watches for you to enjoy. Thanks guys. You've been chatting with John P. Ciao.